Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar, an introduction to critical trauma theory and its relationship to substance use disorders in Latinx communities. This is the first episode of a two-part webinar series on this topic. My name is Maxine Henry, the co-director for the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center. I will be your host for today's webinar. Anna, next slide, please. Sorry, hold on one second. There we go. Before I introduce you to today's guest presenter, here are some brief instructions about today's webinar. Next slide, please. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will also be dubbed or closed caption in Spanish and eventually also in Portuguese. A copy of today's presentation will also be made available after the webinar. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so as to minimize background noise and other interference. When we get to the Q&A portion of our webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions by clicking the Q&A box and I will present your questions to the presenter. We will also be asking you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this webinar. This satisfaction evaluation is important to the work we do and provides us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. You will be immediately redirected to this evaluation. You will also have an opportunity to um, access the evaluation um, at your convenience within the next day via a QR code and or a link. Although we did not secure continuing education credits for this event, we plan to do so for future events. A certificate of completion can be sent to you upon request via email after the completion of the satisfaction evaluation. So let's begin. Let's start by introducing the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center and our team. The National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center, or the ATTC, is housed at the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, or NALBA, located in New Mexico. NALBA was established to fill a need for a unified national voice for Latino populations in the behavioral health arena and to bring attention to the great disparities that exist in areas of access, utilization, practice-based research, and adequately trained personnel. The NALBA's executive director is Freda Sandoval. Next slide. Our ATTC is part of the ATTC network, which is an international multidisciplinary resource for professionals in the addictions treatment and recovery services field. Established in 1993 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, the ATTC network is comprised of 10 domestic regional centers, six international HIV centers funded by PEPFAR, two national focus area centers, and a network coordinating office. Together, the network serves the 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Pacific Islands of Guam, America Samoa, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and the Marina Islands. The international HIV ATTCs serve Vietnam, Southeast Asia, South Africa, and Ukraine. Here you will see a map of the U.S.-based ATTCs. The National Hispanic and Latino ATTC has a national focus for Hispanic and Latino communities and the workforce that provides services to these communities. Next slide. Our ATTC is staffed by Dr. Pierre Luigi Mancini, our project director. I serve as the project co-director and Ruth Yanez is our executive administrative assistant. The National Latino Behavioral Health Association is also the home of our sister TTC, the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We will provide contact information at the end of this webinar. Next slide. Our esteemed presenter for today is Anna Nelson, LCSW. She is an educator for the previous decade and helping has been an educator for the previous decade and has been helping professionals since 1996. Anna is a college assistant professor with New Mexico State University School of Social Work and a PhD candidate in educational leadership and administration. 
Ms. Nelson employs mixed methods, participatory action research, grounded in critical race and intersectionality theories to understand cultural, cumulative, and collective trauma and its impact on communities with a strong focus on identity-driven resilience and resistance. From 2010 to 2016, she served as executive director of the New Mexico Forum for Youth and Community, a statewide network intermediary that promoted racial, health, academic, and economic justice for all youth statewide. Her professional practice emphasizes our youth, family, and community engagement, violence prevention, trauma, and healing-informed, culturally sustaining service systems development, and policy transformation, particularly for child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Ms. Nelson is a Robert Wood Johnson Ladder to Leadership Fellow. For her work in successfully reducing the rate of teen dating violence in New Mexico, Ms. Nelson was the recipient of the 2011 Patty Jennings and Polly Arango Citizen Advocacy Award. For her work in promoting social justice and equity in education, Ms. Nelson is the recipient of the New Mexico Education Equity Alliance 2013 Annual Fueling Increasingly Relevant Education Award and the YWCA New Mexico Women on the Move to Eliminate Racism Award in 2015. Wow. Let me just tell you, Anna, it is absolutely a pleasure and an honor to be working with you. We are so excited to learn from you today. Uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Maxine, and especially for that warm welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Anna Nelson, and I am incredibly honored and also really humbled to be here today. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, critical trauma theory and ways in which we can integrate this into our work in substance use prevention and treatment. And I'd like to start off with, uh, you know, in the spirit of decolonializing our work, I really felt it was important to begin with the land acknowledgement. So today I have the honor of presenting from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects Indigenous First Nations peoples as the traditional stewards of this land and their enduring relationship that exists between Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. So here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I would like to honor and express my gratitude to the 23 tribes and pueblos of New Mexico, where I live and work. And I'm truly humbled by the opportunity to present this information as a guest on these lands. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of working to be in good relationship with the people of this land, the stewards of this land, and with the land itself. And I'd like to share as a multi-ethnic woman with Portuguese heritage, also raising a biracial son who identifies as African-American, my positionality, you know, that th these are daily conversations we have at my dinner table. And so to bring them to you all today was really important. And I'm also doing this in memory of my mother who passed from an opioid addiction. So that is the positionality from which I come to discuss this information. So I have a lot of aspirations for this conversation today, and I truly wish it was a conversation. And, and definitely I see some folks here in chat that are from Albuquerque. So welcome partners here in Albuquerque. Uh, so today what I hope for our brief time together is to really expand our understanding of what has become to be known as trauma-informed substance use treatment. So we hopefully will take that to the next level with a culturally sustainable lens and also propose a paradigm shift toward culturally sustaining critical trauma approaches to substance use treatment and prevention. And we will also explore a framework for culturally sustaining critical trauma grounded substance use treatment. And finally, we will, I will introduce just a few key critical trauma substance use treatment uh, strategies or approaches. We'll also look at the idea of critical allyship, which is so critical and so vital in this work. And then finally, the radical self-care strategies that will all be discussed in webinar two if you're able to join us. 
So um, this has been a life's passion for me. I think Maxine mentioned this is my 26th year in the field of social work. And I, I really became um, deeply rooted and connected in the work of substance use treatment and prevention early on in my career. And what became um, really evident to me in this work is what the research is telling us is that um, trauma-informed practice is seen as a new frontier. Um, but what we don't well understand yet is understanding um, its correlation with types of oppression. And so we do know that there is a correlation between trauma exposure, and you'll hear me use that term pretty frequently, versus victimization. Uh, I also use substance use. I'd like to make mention that when I say substance use, I'm also including uh, use of alcohol in that terminology as well. But you know, the research tells us that there's a strong correlation between trauma exposure and then risk for use of substances to self-medicate. But what is not well understood are those points of cumulative cultural and collective traumas in Latinx individuals, communities. And this, of course, includes uh, immigration and acculture acculturation related traumas. These are really important to explore given the emerging body of knowledge where we are understanding now that microaggressions, which is a type of oppression, uh, racism itself, sexism, homophobia, these are all correlated with risk for emotional trauma and in fact produce the same physiological and behavioral health needs as other types of emotional trauma. And finally, culturally rooted resilience and resistance are vital in the process of healing. Uh, so my, my personal, I mentioned my positionality, one of the pieces of my positionality that is so critical is I do believe there is an opportunity to heal from substance use. And we don't often get to talk about this process of healing. So, so that's what's centering our conversation for today. In addition to that, substance use among Latinx communities, it's closely related with the presence of post-traumatic stress syndrome, so that's PTSD, and attempts to manage symptoms of PTSD. And interestingly, in this study I cite here, drug use in the study was strongly correlated with symptoms of hyperarousal, so that's hypervigilance, a sense of irritability, and exaggerated startle responses. And then for the use of alcohol, that is associated with avoidance and the need to numb symptoms. Depression, generalized anxiety, living paycheck to paycheck, which I imagine lots of us can identify with, uh, acculturation-related stress, discrimination, family conflict, and a low sense of ethnic identity or belonging are psychosocial factors that do significantly um, correlate with substance use. And then also migration stress, which we'll talk specifically briefly about, trauma exposure and living in communities with high rates of crime are psychosocial factors evidenced as well to increase risk for um, the, the co-occurrence of PTSD and use of alcohol and substances and what is emerging um, and what we already know at the community level, but what's emerging strongly is that um, a sense of ethnic pride and a sense of identity, as well as our sense of belonging uh, within our communities, within our families are in fact protective. So I, I need, always need to take a deep breath before I read this out. It's a long definition and I apologize for that. So in my journey of trying to better understand these types of trauma that are not well addressed, you know, in, in our treatment work, not well addressed theoretically, uh, I developed a, a definition of what I'm calling trauma or oppression-based trauma. And so oppression-based trauma is exposure to or the lived experiences of personally mediated, and that's person to person, institutional and structural forms of oppression. And that comes from Dr. Kamara Jones. Um, and this is done symbolically, emotionally, verbally, physically, sexually, or economically across one's lifespan. Oppression-based trauma exposure includes, but is not limited to linguicism, so not being able to speak our first languages, uh, racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, 
transphobia, xenophobia, which we are seeing a, a distinct rise um, in these previous few years, Islamophobia, colonialism, political, historical, and intergenerational trauma, and acts of oppression because of one's immigration status, refugee status, or former incarceration status. So this is the lens through which I am I'm viewing um, a trauma-informed or you know, culturally sustaining approaches. So for the types of oppression-based trauma, I just, I pulled from the literature about some, you know, some really powerful quotes to help to us to distinguish between different types of trauma. So for individual trauma, that's really seen as a blow to the psyche that breaks through one's defenses so suddenly and with such brutal force that one's coping mechanisms are rendered useless. And I just found that to be a really moving description of um, traumatic experiences at the individual level. And then collective trauma is a blow to the basic tissue of social life that damages our bonds that attach us to others. Um, so attaching people together and impairs the prevailing sense of community. And that was also incredibly moving for me, um, thinking about what resilience we draw from our sense of belonging and community. Cumulative trauma are those multiple exposures to traumatic events over time where the person impacted experiences high degrees of stress associated with these traumas. And then finally, cultural trauma. You know, I was curious about that because I see culture as such a source of resilience and resistance. I wanted to understand what cultural trauma, how it was defined in the literature. And uh, what the literature tells us is cultural traumas are an invasive and overwhelming event that is believed to overwhelm and undermine several key aspects of a culture. So those traditions upon which we rely for healing and sustenance and resistance and resilience. So, um, so I found that to be incredibly powerful as well. So that leads us to our first polling question. And the polling question, um, I'll get some help from our technical folks to get that up there. I, you are able to respond within the platform. And the first polling question is, what is the Latinx paradox? And I'll just give you a few minutes to answer that. I really encourage, this is an anonymous poll, so feel free to answer. There, there's no wrong answer. Okay, wonderful. I imagine most folks have been able to respond. Oh man, that's too fast. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Okay, so so for this answer, um, th so uh, let's see, 5% said it was an epidemiological phenomena. About 8% said it was related to health and behavioral health outcomes for Latinx who are immigrants. And then finally, um, connecting with strong family and community ties. Uh, the majority of you all selected all of the above, and that's absolutely true. So this is, a, you know, a, an epi concept, an epidemiological concept, um, and it's very powerful in terms of how we understand our health and well-being, especially for those who have recently immigrated to the United States. Um, and, and what's important to know about this, and I believe strongly related with oppression-based trauma, is that within one generation, um, our, our Latinx recently immigrated families have the same poor health outcomes as people here in the United States, particularly communities of color. So, um, so that's powerful and it teaches us a lot about ways in which we, we need to promote resilience and healing. So just briefly and you know and, and sometimes I do these um, these slides only to you know ensure that all of us together here today uh, have a, a sort of a basic framework or common terminology so I wanted to speak specifically to migration related trauma so as we are approach serving immigrants it's really critical especially you know for those of us new in the field to remember 
to understand the statuses or the points of identity that our folks who are immigrating here um, are, are identifying. So are um, folks identifying as refugees, as asylum seekers? Um, are these young people who are unaccompanied, people who are being trafficked, or people who are fleeing violence, persecution, environmental, and economic disasters? Uh, and so, you know, and as we um, safely and openly create space for folks to self-identify, that helps us to understand what types of trauma they could have been exposed to. And common, unfortunately common types of trauma our immigrants, folks, you know, coming here experience include, uh, and then once they arrive, of course, I can't um, forget to mention that. So upon their travels and then once arriving here in the United States, so abuse of human rights, physical violence, sexual violence, uh, incarceration or detention, either in their, their country of origin or here, uh, separation from their families, racism, religious oppression, and xenophobia, severe illness, starvation, and lack of access to medical care. And that's something we saw here in New Mexico recently, um, where families to whom we were responding were um, dealing with, with a multitude of um, stressors and trauma exposure, and were also simultaneously dealing with starvation and the need for access to basic medical care. And then rapid onset behavioral health issues, near-death experiences during migration, and then finally witnessing a death of a loved one. So again, um, factors impacting migra migration-related trauma are um, histories, are um, individuals' histories with pre-migration pre trauma, chronic deprivation, um, also poverty, relocation, and chronic stress. Uh, types of physical and sexual abuse, including, uh, including torture, loss of property, learning new languages and customs, exposure to war, political violence, and genocide, forced separation of families, and death of or separation from parents and primary caregivers. So that leads me to, um, to also bring into our dialogue the, the concept of complex or disenfranchised grief, which is often not discussed uh, as well. And this, this, does, um, this is also in the literature found to correlate with substance use or, or the risk of substance use as a form of self-medication. So complex grief involves prolonged unresolved feelings, a sense of feeling overwhelmed, symptoms of traumatic distress, maladaptive behavior, and persistent disbelief about the loss. It occurs when the loss does not receive normal social support, so, and it's not openly acknowledged um, and cannot be mourned in a way that honors tradition or that is honored at all. So, um, migration-related complex grief may include loss of our cultural identities, of social support networks, an increase, a significant increase in a sense of isolation, which can be very profound, a loss of loved ones during or because of migration, family separation, lack of social sanctions to adequately grieve, and then barriers again to traditional grief practices and healing practices. Okay, so we're at polling question number two. Um, so, so this is kind of a, a term that I um, wanted to also bring into our dialogue, which is ethnic glossing. And I'm curious to know how many of us understand what the term ethnic glossing means. So we'll have a few minutes there to answer this. Okay, so I think we've had enough time. Let's see what the result, oh, wow. Okay, so many of you answered A, which was, you know, this is a relatively new term for me to learn about as well, and I was excited to share it with you today. Um, so about 66% of us said we've never heard of the term before. Um, about 31% said that they, they are familiar with the term, and 3% of us say that, we feel confidently in that we know what ethnic glossing means. And so ethnic glossing, um, so it, when we think about Latinx 
identity. It is, it is vastly diverse and so rich. Uh, and what was really important in the development of uh, this model of critical trauma approaches is to understand that we, we want to be mindful, even within our own communities, of this term ethnic glossing, which is to ignore the potentially wide variability of factors that impact behavior within any ethnic group. Uh, and so pieces where I have personally seen, and I'm also going to share a story where I have participated in ethnic glossing. Um, so uh, places where we might have uh, observed this include perceptions of helping professionals, um, we might make assumptions about roles of family and healing from substance use, and that specifically was the area, you know, that comes to mind for me when I was out in the field working with uh, people impacted by substance use. I was working with a young gentleman who was um, who was getting ready to be released from incarceration, and I made an assumption that he had family to go home to, and this was a source of, of real great suffering for him, and he was able to share with me in this dialogue, you know, my question was, you know, who from your family will you be able to receive support once you come back into community, um, and, and he felt really um, hurt by both the question and the assumption. And so I wanted to share that as a, something I learned while, while practicing out in the field. Also traditional gender identity roles. So machismo and marinismo um, in, in both, you know, its positive connotations as well as its colonized connotations, um, making assumptions around that can be detrimental to a person's healing process. Religious affiliation, relationship status, parenting status, um, also a source of suffering for those um, who may not be able or, or haven't um, been parents. And then a belief in ethnic pride for some people, especially those who are removed from community at an early age, uh, that's not an area where some folks feel confidently. And so this may be in a time for them to explore their sense of ethnic identity and pride. And then finally, the, the ability to speak heritage language or their first language. Oh, and it, excellent. So some, someone asked um, the question about Marianismo and what Marianismo is. So, you know, Marianismo is the complement to a traditional belief of machismo. And um, so it would be the more feminine form of expression of role in family. Um, important to note about Marianismo. So again, there are colonized ways that Marianismo and machismo um, have been applied, and, and I'm specifically speaking more to the tradition with Marinismo, where there is a balance that's created between roles within a family, and those who ascribe to the role of Marinismo are often tasked with the spiritual and um, the educational growth and well-being of their, their children, their family members. Uh, it's also a role of um, caregiving and of, you know, of nurturance, and and machismo may be attached in it. And I'm trying to make this as de-gendered as possible as well, because um, in its most traditional form, there's a balance that's created. So machismo is, you know, is typically associated with the values of prote protection and to provide. So, um, so when there is a healthy balance in a relationship, um, even in same-sex relationships, then that creates a sense of of family well-being. So that is, you know, my understanding of money in these small, there can be, of course, other interpretations of that. Um, I did share machismo and marinismo at a, a conference not too long ago here in New Mexico, and and um, there was a, a participant who really expressed her experiences with um, oppression associated with that term. And so I always want to honor and uplift those those people um, who have had oppressive experiences with those identities. And again, remind us that those those can be colonized um, as well. So in its most traditional form, uh, it is meant to achieve a balance in a relationship. So thank you for that excellent question. Okay, so um, so this is the part, you know, I was sharing with Pierluigi and Maxine and Ruth um, when I had the opportunity to go through some of this content. This is kind of the school part, and I apologize, you're going to see the teacher come out in me. <laughs> so, you know, this is just to give us a foundation of where some of these 
these thinking, this thinking is coming from. Uh, so in um, jurisprudence, so in the study of law, emerged this theory called critical race theory. And it's about 30 years old at this point. Um, and, it's, and it's really powerful in the ways in which it analyzes dominant culture, society as a whole, and, and how um, communities are marginalized. And so critical race theory is, has some key tenets, um, the first tenet of which is the intercentricity of race and ra racism with other forms of oppression in the United States. So in, its, um, in every point at, in critical race theory, there is a radical acknowledgement that race and racism is incontrovertible and absolutely exists within dominant culture. And so, um, so it's important to know that that, you know, it's sort of a radical approach to things. The centrality of experiential knowledge is something I also really love about critical race theory. Uh, the centrality of experiential knowledge means that through our lived expertise and our, and our knowledge um, that comes from our, our ways of being, our traditions, um, those points of knowing are as valid and valuable as an empirical study is. And so this tenet of CRT allows for understanding people's experiences, not solely from their lived experiences, but also analyze the social phenomena in a historical way through its cultural context and, um, and you know, helps us to see it more broadly than, than maybe a narrow, narrower view of um, what is considered knowledge. And then I love this as well, this um, tenet of challenging revisionist history. So uh, that means that, that we get to question what, is, um, what the dominant narrative is about how things occurred historically and how things occur presently. Uh, there's also a critical, a, um, a critical, a critical analysis of liberalism um, and CRT scholars, what they believe is that liberalism isn't sufficient to change the oppressive dynamics that exist in the United States. Uh, finally, and really importantly to me, is the um, commitment to social justice. So that's, that's what inspired me for this dialogue today. And that leads us then to understanding uh, the, the trauma, critical trauma theory that I am proposing. So, um, so critical trauma theory in, in what I'm hoping to evidence and um, what I'm studying currently in New Mexico specifically, it is an anti-oppressive, socially just micro theory that analyzes behavioral health symptoms, prevention and treatment approaches, and also organizational and institutional policies and practices through the lens of cultural humility. And we're gonna talk a lot about cultural humility as well. Um, and intersectionality is the idea that we don't, we don't solely approach things from one point of identity, that we have multiple points of identity that create our sense of self and um, how we view the world. So that's intersectionality. And so, Essentially, what critical trauma theory does is it, it radically acknowledges oppression-centered structural and institutional barriers to behavioral health here in the United States. Um, it acknowledges that oppression-based trauma is ever-present, and it's also correlated with risk for substance use. But I think equally importantly is that um, is the idea of the centrality of experiential knowledges, knowledge evidences that while these other things are occurring, we also experience post-traumatic growth, healing, resilience, and resistance in the face of oppression. So this isn't, um, this really isn't about, you know, solely that there are these risk factors. In fact, I, I'm, if I could say one thing I hope that we all leave this dialogue with um, is a belief and, and an a point of inspiration from all these points of healing and resilience that we have um, rather than looking solely at risk. Uh, so because of the prevalence of oppression-based trauma and its impact on behavioral health outcomes for Latinx individuals, families, and communities, um, I'm kind of asserting here, I'm putting forward that critical trauma theory is a socially just addition to behavioral health theories. And that's what we're discussing today. So again, this is, you know, this is about, um, 
you know, kind of building on the previous knowledge. So I, I started studying trauma-informed approaches in the early 2000s, um, both studying and applying trauma-informed approaches. You know, I had the honor to, to be able to do this at a broader systemic level through our New Mexico Department of Health, but I've done it um, probably most impactfully at the community level when I was serving families um, impacted by substance use, incarceration, and systems involvement, for example, with child protective services. And so the way that, um, the way that trauma-informed uh, is described, especially by SAMHSA, is that it's a program, an organization, or a system that realizes the widespread impact of trauma. It also understands the potential paths for recovery. Uh, I also pulled from a, an additional definition for, um, for trauma-informed, which looks at the understanding of how trauma exposure affects neurological, biological, psychological, and social development. And then I, I just kind of wanted to, you know, again, this is probably a review for many of you, but just very quickly, I wanted to share the, the idea of trauma-specific versus trauma-informed. And many of you are probably expert on the fact that trauma-specific is really those approaches that are designed specifically to address trauma exposure, um, the consequences of trauma in, you know, it, in the individual specifically. Um, there are some key tenants that typically happen uh, in trauma-specific services that are around demonstrating respect, um, really uplifting the value of the individual being served, um, and ensure that they're well-informed, that they're connected with resources, and that there's a sense of hope um, you know, in terms of their recovery and their resiliency and healing. And trauma-informed, different from trauma-specific, trauma-informed, the idea is, is we don't just stop with the specific type of service we're providing, but we want to radically, you know, transform the organizations where we do this work um, at the policy level, at the, you know, at the programmatic level. Um, so trauma-informed, systems are really about those organizations, programs, and services that are based on the understanding of vulnerabilities or those triggers to trauma. Um, and that happens at every level in the, within the organization. And so uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provide us with this really wonderful graphic uh, that helps to break down the six guiding principles to a trauma-informed approach. And they name safety, trustworthiness trans and transparency. They identify peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice. And so I'd, I'd like to pause there because again, from my positionality, empowerment is, a, from my perspective, is a challenging word um, because that assumes that we have power over um, and, and somebody needs to be imbued with power. Um, and so what I'd like to kind of suggest is an alternative way to look at that. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that too. And then cultural, historical, and gender issues. Oh, and, and thank you so much. So I'm noticing before I go to the next slide, there's a great question about intersectionality. How do you delineate the trauma experience for Latinx communities of color from white Latinx identifying individuals. Um, and then a great question about ethnic stereotyping or, um, so good question about ethnic glossing. The, the intent there is less about stereotyping um, with ethnic glossing and much more about our own sense of, of what we perceive to be um, the connections we make with people who we perceive to have a similar identity as our own. So rather than stereotyping, we are more looking through our own internal lens um, versus, you know, making a broad assumption about a, a different population than our own. So ethnic glossing is our own work that we will do, you know, to make sure that we're open to individuals self-identifying in any way that they would like. And back to the question about intersectionality, 
Um, so I would say quickly before I move on to the next slide, the trauma experience for Latinx communities of color from um, from Anglo Latinx. So there, there's a piece there that I want to say about colorism or skin privilege um, that may play a role. It definitely doesn't minimize the impact of oppression on um, populations who identify as Latinx, but I would say there is a, an element there of colorism that may shift um, an individual's experience. And I would also say that as, as we um, become more open to allowing individuals to, to share their points of identity with us, they in fact will help us to discover how these points of intersectionality relate to the types of oppression they have been directly impacted by. So um, it's just, it, to me, it, there's not a clear cut way of delineating. Instead, it's about allowing for those dialogue to happen. So, okay, so um, here's, here's how critical trauma approach might look differently than the six previous principles that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provided us. So, um, you know, rethinking those six principles, we definitely want to start with safety. Um, and the way that I'm proposing we look at safety is really about emotional, um, as well as our ability to, again, be ourselves and who, um, who and how we want to identify a spiritual safety, as well as cognitive and physical safety. So, you know, I, I wanted us to reframe safety to also include those elements of cultural identity. Trustworthiness and transparency is vital. And um, I'm looking at peer support still as being incredibly valuable, but there is so much to be said about circles of support that come from communities where we, you know, safely connect and feel that our identities are both valued and validated. And then collaboration and mutuality. I mentioned um, how, how I kind of look at the term empowerment. And I'd like to consider reframing that to the creation of pathways to power. So for those of us with privilege, you know, as people who are, have education, people who have um, full-time jobs, you know, with some, you know, economic stability, we have a sense of power that we can share and create pathways and we can leverage the relationships that we have to benefit the people who we serve. So that would include voice and choice. Um, and then in the center, rather, so if, if you can remember at the very end, um, principle number six was the cultural, historical, and gender issues. And I'd like to say that should be really centric to this model and everything that we do should, should take into account cultural and other identity-based uh, resilience and resistance as well as pathways to healing. Okay, so trauma-informed principles through a culturally specific lens. I was so honored. So um, in preparing for this dialogue, you know, I, I went ahead and, and just kind of perused the literature beyond what, I, what I've been studying for, um, for my dissertation, but I was so honored to see that, um, that there, there is a document and the link is provided in the references. And I highly recommend that you all um, download this particular article. It's incredibly powerful and um, done by community. So literally these are researchers that build from their own lived expertise, um, one of whom is from New Mexico. And so I feel very appreciative of their collective work. And so what they were able to help us to learn more about is um, violence prevention, cultural wellness and resilience, um, how, how they shift trauma informed definitions. So they're helping us to understand that it's important to realize and radically acknowledge the pervasive nature of trauma exposure for individuals and the collective community while we still honor the presence of individual and collective strength and resilience. So kind of really bringing home that idea of, of strength and resilience um, being a natural part of our existence. And then recognize the impact of trauma exposure on individuals, communities, organizations, and systems while we still uplift individual and collective growth and healing. Principle number three is really about responding in a culturally sustaining way uh, through applying traditional, and I'm going to define culturally sustaining here in a second, um, through applying traditional and community knowledge 
about successful ways to promote safety, wellness, and healing. And then finally, to resist re-traumatization by drawing from, again, our sense of cultural resilience, traditional healing tools, and collective wisdom. So um, they give us some additional ways to do that. And there's um, centered in this approach is the need to um, preserve and to honor relationships based on mutuality and respect. And, you know, again, back to the question about ethnic glossing, um, our continual uh, commitment to a deep understanding of the communities in which we work. Uh, so even as members in those communities, how can we better, um, how can we kind of better understand and continue to learn and grow, especially from elders and from young people in our communities, um, and centralize this cultural understanding of our work and then understand the origins of trauma, including historical, collective, and intergenerational transmission of trauma. Um, do not minimize resiliency, wisdom, or strength of survivors. And then um, keeping the realities of the people, the families who we serve centered in our work. And this, this was particularly powerful for me and a really good reminder and, um, you know, when I've been reflective on my past work, it is so important uh, to believe this work is a collective effort and that we, you know, no one organization or no one provider is alone in this work, nor can we shift the, the prevalence of exposure to, um, to substance use or to oppression-related trauma or to violence. So believe in the power and the collective wisdom of communities. That to me was really inspirational. Uh, so just to kind of, again, touch on some terminology, one that I find myself really drawn to and have used a lot in this work is post-traumatic growth and resilience. And so for me, you know, because I'm um, a young person not too long ago referred to me as an emerging elder. <laughs> so I was super honored. And then I was also like, okay, <laughs> that's just a good reminder that, um, you know, that I've been in this work for a, a while. So, um, so, but when I, when I first started, when I went to um, get my MSW in the early 2000s, um, when, when we were talking about trauma, there, there was no, there was nothing first from a lens of cultural um, resilience and healing. And also importantly, there was, there was no concept of growth and resilience beyond um, a traumatic exposure. And so it was kind of fatalistic and, it, and really quite disturbing. And then when you, you go out into community and actually do this work, the people we serve repeatedly show us that that's not true, that absolutely there is resilience and healing happening. So um, I wanted just to introduce that term. That, you know, there, there has been some research on it by Tedeschi and Calhoun. And what they notice is resilience is evident. It's a protective factor. Um, Post-traumatic growth is considered a manifestation of positive change after an adverse life-altering experience. It's, it's possible, um, it in fact is, it frequently happens that people have interpersonal distress and emotional growth at the same time. And traumatic change is experiential, therefore it's extremely powerful. And then finally, when survivors become comfortable in the realm of paradox, then post-traumatic growth is in fact a possibility. So, you know, I also wanna kind of challenge this, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, I should have um, taken a look to make sure that I um, took out the term survivors. So, so I, I wanna say people are exposed to trauma. People are intact and they have a trauma exposure and they continue to be intact. And so, um, so, so I, I don't wanna discourage anyone where the term survivor really resonates for them, but I also wanna just suggest that um, people have strength and have lived experiences and trauma happens to be a lived experience. So, um, so you know, just to kind of help us to continue to, to think differently um, in the way we approach the families and people who we serve. Okay, so excellent. Okay, so we're coming down to our polling question number three, which is, um, which of the following is considered a culturally sustaining source for post-traumatic growth and resilience among Latinx communities and people? Okay, maybe one, a couple more seconds. 
I'm interested to see what everyone says. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So, um, so this is great. So 4% said a college education and that's, that's globally considered a point of resilience as well as uh, living in a neighborhood um, with high socioeconomic status. But specifically for Latinx communities, having a sense of purpose and ability to make a difference in others' lives is absolutely um, a culturally sustainable point of post-traumatic growth and resilience. So that's, so 94% of you resonated with that. So um, again, this is built on a, a pretty robust literature review about uh, what's known to be points of post-traumatic growth and resilience from a, from a cultural perspective. Again, sense of belonging and strong family connections a positive sense of ethnic identity, very important, and connections with elders. And, and um, by that, I mean also contributing to the well-being of elders while learning from elders in terms of, of traditions, life ways, as well as their lived experiences with dealing with, um, with suffering and how did they do that in a way that was resilient a sense of spirituality, a sense of collectivism and community, a sense of purpose. And, and this actually is, um, this is really, again, this kind of stems from my youth work, but so powerful um, to give meaningful pathways for community impact work. And so what that would mean is that for those young people who may have been seen through the lens of risk, right? Like they're, they might have risk for substance use or um, risk for truancy or dropout uh, or push out. The, a different way to look at that is they are valuable contributing members in community. And when they're giving meaningful pathways to actually positively influence and, and engage with community, that is seen as protective. And then again, resistance voice and the ability to contribute. Okay, um, and also just because I, I feel, again, you know, it, it, resilience, again, might be emerging more in conversation or in the literature, but I do feel that there is um, so much more that we could do in terms of speaking from a culturally sustaining perspective. Uh, so, so acculturation, you know, is a tricky thing because acculturation can also be incredibly negative. Um, but there are aspects of, of developing skills necessary to thrive. Um, and we'll talk about this in a, a moment with types of cultural capital. Um, but the, the idea that we can acquire skills necessary, necessary to thrive in an environment with multiple cultures there's also a beautiful concept of navigating borders um, where there's this opportunity to thrive as well in an ever-changing environment. And then intra and internal um, cultural communication, the idea that we can access skills to effectively communicate and understand others uh, from different cultural identities a sense of teamwork, and then finally and importantly, creative self-expression. So a lot of the work that I do now out in community is, um, is centering around an approach called photo voice, which is this opportunity for individuals to take pictures of imagery that, that is symbolic and very important to them. And it gives them an opportunity both to share the meaning of those symbols through pictures, but also through sharing what it means to them directly. And that is a, a really powerful way to get folks involved in a more creative way. So um, this again, you know, not to belabor types of resilience. Um, I think, you know, the, the important ones I wanted to share, you know, for example, I love humor as, as an opportunity for resilience, um, a high sense of self-worth, you know, the sense of self-efficacy or the belief that you can accomplish something you set your mind to. So, you know, it's that belief um, that I think is really critical. And it's something we as helping professionals or, or people who promote healing, we want to, to inspire um, that belief that that healing can occur and that everyone has within them the natural ability to heal. So that leads me to, I mentioned, you know, 
uh, I keep naming this term culturally sustaining. And the best way that I can describe culturally sustaining approaches is that these are our approaches when we're addressing substance use that honor cultural resilience, that acknowledge the systems and institutional forms of oppression that contribute to substance use. And then finally, that we seek to promote cultural cohesion, social justice and equity as part of healing from addiction. And you know that necessarily means that when points of oppression are occurring, that we have an opportunity to challenge those you know, points of oppression. So there's, there's kind of advocacy naturally embedded in this idea of culturally sustaining approaches. And it's definitely moving us away from cultural competence. So, um, you know, I always talk with my students about like I, when cultural competence, the term came out, it really frustrated me because I felt that there was a sense that, you know, when you achieve, so there was a perception that you could achieve cultural competence and that that would be sort of the end of your learning. Um, and truly, we're only culturally competent and fully culturally competent in our own lived experiences. Um, but over, over the years, it, it's become um, apparent to me that cultural competence is in fact important for, and I always share with my students, you know, it's like how not to be overtly offensive, right? We, we start with that and we build from that. So, um, so moving from culturally competent to culturally responsive. Um, and then we hear this term quite a lot in, in the community, which is culturally relevant. Um, and I, I do think that's an important step. It's saying, I want to provide those services that really value and validate your, your points of identity and your points of resilience um, through the lens that's important for you. But culturally sustaining takes it one step further where we, we actually look at what needs to be transformed in order for, for communities to heal and for individuals to heal as well. So um, what that might look like is, and, and we'll talk more about this, I really hope you all are able to join webinar two where we, we dig into some really pragmatic, and today we're talking a lot about a lot of concepts, and in webinar two, we'll be talking about pragmatic strategies and approaches, um, one of which um, is critical self-reflectivity. So when we approach something from a critical trauma grounded um, or a culturally sustainable way, we want to start with critical self-reflectivity. Um, critical, uh, vital in that as well is our need to commit to radical self-care. And that webinar too um, is something I really explore strongly is that idea of radical self-care. Critical allyship is also very important, um, and that means uh, with communities, with our colleagues, with others, and finally, you know, a culturally humble approach to substance use treatment with culture at the center. Um, this was also something, you know, so we're, we're getting near the end of our, you know, our, our content here, um, and this is something that, um, I, I felt was when I learned these terms, um, it, it was, I felt revolutionary in a way that, that really validated um, some things I've always wondered about or were curious about within my own lived experiences. Uh, and it, it just, to me, it, it felt important to share this with everyone that there is a different way to name and to identify cultural capital. So there's sort of a dominant culture, cultural capital concept that's linked to education specifically. And it's usually about things like, you know, did you have, you know, the financial resources to be able to go to museums and, you know, um, Sometimes I hear like exposure to different types of music, like classical music, or did you have those types of resources within the community in which you lived? Um, and there is, there's just so much more that could be looked at in terms of cultural capital. And so Tara Yoso in 2005, so she's another critical race scholar. Um, she created an article called Whose Culture Has Capital? And what she shared with us are these six types of cultural capital, and that includes aspirational capital. That's that, that ability to maintain your hopes and dreams, even in the face of, you know, really difficult adversity. So you stick to those hopes and dreams, and, and that is a sense of, you know, that's that fight that, that you know, that heart that comes to the healing process. Um, 
Familial capital is the idea of the cultural knowledge nurtured among familia and kin that carry a sense of collective history, memory, and cultural intuition. So it's not just do you have family who can be there to help you out occasionally. No, this really is about us being able to have a sense of collective history and to remember how things were in the past and how things can be in the future as well as a sense of culture, a cultural intuition. A social capital is pretty widely known, um, and, that, and that is, in fact, the ability to access concrete and emotional support. But then we get into navigational capital. And as an educator, you know, and as a behavioral health provider, those are two systems that were not designed for or by communities of color necessarily. Um, so the idea of navigational capital is that we have skills to maneuver through institutions that were not created for or by our communities. Uh, resisting capital is another one of my favorites, and that's about the skills and knowledge fostered through what might be looked at as, as oppositional behavior, but it's really, you know, speaking truth to power and saying, um, I, you know, having this inherent knowing within oneself that something is unjust um, or inequitable. And then, of course, linguistic capital, this, you know, these skills that come from speaking more than one language. In fact, you know, it's, it's widely known that, um, that people who have, who are bi or multiple, or can speak multiple languages, um, in fact, brains are patterned differently and there is an enhanced sense of problem solving and also just an increased perspective, diverse perspective of the world. So linguistic capital is a huge part of this. And let me go into the next slide, sorry. Apologies, okay, I think, no. Oh, there we go. Okay. So consistently practicing cultural humility. So this is also from our partners in public health. Um, this was a concept that was introduced in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and because we're running a bit close on time, um, I, I want to just share this with you. This is uh, another, I think, very powerful um, paradigm shifting way of looking at our work. So if we practice cultural humility, what that means is we are committing to lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. And, um, and by critical self-reflection, um, that means that, that we would create a practice that, that is regular or, you know, if not daily, at least regularly where we ask questions like, you know, what did I do that may contribute to equity and social justice? How can I better act as a critical ally? Those are some um, critical self-reflection prompters, if you will. Um, and a way to do this professionally is to strive for a continual improvement in culturally sustaining treatment approaches and make sure that we're embedding the social, historical, and economic context into the assessment process that we you know use in our daily work and then also that we seek feedback and mentorship from those with lived expertise and sometimes that you know often that means reaching out to elders or to folks who've been in this work for a very long time the second key tenet of cultural humility is really about recognizing and challenging power imbalances and that's about understanding and acknowledging our own points of privilege and disprivilege and our points of implicit biases. Um, biases can be positive as well. So, you know, it's, it's really about um, examining the ways in which we perceive the world and expanding those perceptions to, to include multiple points of um, identity and other, you know, other aspects. So accept full responsibility um, for negative impact. So a lot of the work that I do out in community is uh, from an anti-oppression standpoint. And um, there's a great tool that we'll talk about in webinar two called in Intent Versus Impact. And it's a, a way to navigate through difficult conversations. Um, recognizing and challenging power imbalances at the professional level is really examining from a critical lens how we engage, how, what assessment tools we're using, our treatment approaches, um, how much are we able to evoke those points of resilience and those points of healing. Um, it also talks about um, this aspect of being a critical ally to clients and to colleagues when appropriate. 
Uh, and then, you know, the, the final key tenet of cultural humility is really about holding systems and institutions accountable. And for some of us in the work, you know, it's, it's really important for us to acknowledge our, our own points of vulnerability. Sometimes it's not possible for us to do that safely in institutions. Sometimes, however, it is. And, um, and if you happen to be a, in a position of decision making, there are some amazing ways that, that we can each take a stand and hold systems and institutions accountable for oppressive practices. So, um, you know, at the personal level, it kind of requires us to radically commit to social justice and action. Um, and then at the at the, the should say professional, at the professional level, leveraging personal points of privilege and power through creating pathways for power. So again, thinking less about empowerment and more about um, power sharing or power, you know, giving pathways to power. And then engaging in critical collaboration and, um, and challenging oppressive organizational fun and funding policies and practices. So that leads me to our final slide, which is what's next. So, you know, again, this was, this was so humbling and such an honor for me to, to share some of this thinking with you all, to read your excellent questions. I, I think we're going to open it up now for questions and answers. Uh, but I did want to share with you that our next webinar will really dig deep into these critical trauma grounded approaches, um, one of which is counter storytelling and how that can be a point of healing for people um, struggling with substance use, and then explore our experiences as professionals looking at the concepts of microaggressions, racial battle fatigue, which I'll talk a lot about in webinar two, um, this idea of spotlighting and other workplace forms of oppression that impede our long-term engagement in the work. It, you know, it's, it's um, sometimes this is the stuff that wears us down and makes it difficult to keep going with this work. Um, I also didn't add in here, but something I'll discuss is, um, is also the idea of resilience fatigue. Um, so, you know, yes, we're, we're saying resilience is, is something we possessed, possess intrinsically. Um, we can also get, you know, that can be worn down over time. And so how do we, through a plan for radical self-care, as well as this idea of critical allyship, how do we maintain that sense of resilience? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderators and... Just thank you so much. And I know the questions will be coming. Wow. So just, you know, I can listen to you talk about this stuff all day. It was absolutely amazing. So thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you for honoring us with all of this valuable information, some of it new, some of it reframed, and some of it just a refresher. And I think sometimes it's really great to have these reminders of the, the power that we have but then how, how much work still has to be done, right? Yes. Um, so thank you. And thank you for the little teaser for the next uh, portion of this webinar series. Can't wait to hear about the practical tools that we could all employ in our work and in our community to help really move this uh, work along. Before we get to the Q&A session here, um, I want to let everybody know I'm about to put the link to the um, evaluation in the chat. Um, I'm posting it here in the chat only in the event that something happens and you're not immediately redirected to the evaluation after this webinar and or you have to leave a couple of minutes early and therefore need to access the evaluation a little later. We truly do read the information that we get in the evaluations and it really is important to us to hear from our community. Uh, what you thought of these types, of, what you think of these types of trainings and how we can either improve upon them and or bring you more trainings. So we yes. really humbly ask each and every one of you to uh, respond to the evaluation. Um, all right. So I know that you answered some of the questions during, but I've been tracking the questions all along and they're quite amazing. So yeah, they're really, really powerful. So I'm noticing, I'm noticing one here. Um, well, first I notice, you know, thank you from our partners down in Texas. Um, the question with regard to how to serve uh, children who have been exposed to um, so migration related trauma as well as um, different forms of trauma. Uh, and, you know, that question is so powerful because I think every community right now is really trying to mobilize and offer as much healing opportunity 
opportunities as possible. Um, if you know, if possible, engaging parents in um, in whatever approaches you are able to. Um, to take in terms of helping children cope with trauma, I think is really important because it, it, it's a whole family approach to healing. Uh, and, you know, there is also the Child Traumatic Stress Network also has some, some pretty, um, I think, positive tools that can be used, especially if you're an, or so, you know, I think I, the question scrolled by, but I think the, um, you were mentioning being in the faith-based community. And so the Child Traumatic Stress Network provides resources both for practitioners who may be licensed, but also for people out in community doing this work um, that are for, I guess, a term might be lay people. Um, so that, that is something that you could access. And again, it's called the Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, and then we have a, a really great question and, and comment around cultural competency. And so thank you so much. I do want to say absolutely, you know, because I'm, I'm close to dinosaur status, right? When cultural competency was, was first being um, talked about, it was very concrete and you know module based and and um, there wasn't a there wasn't I think the depth that was needed and it has absolutely transformed I select and I um, I choose to approach things from a cultural humility perspective because different from cultural competency cultural humility it's both lifelong and it's also you're deeply embracing the social justice aspect of the importance of being humble and of approaching work from a place of um, that that you are in a place of continual learning um, that sense of being humble so humility I, I talk about this sometimes with um, younger social workers as well, words have such power. And when you see humility, sometimes people think that that equates to humiliation. No, what it, what it really is, is about um, owning a, a professional uh, approach of being humble. And that means we're we're constantly open to learning and to growth um, and to, to critically analyzing ourselves. And so the reason I choose to um, select cultural humility as my professional identity is because of, of that radical commitment to social justice and equity. So I hope that that you know, answers your question. I think um, Miss Graves Kroom, I think, is who asked that question. Luis, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, and I'm really honored to be here. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you a few of the questions. Okay, perfect. And, um, our goal is to get to as many of these questions as possible. So if you do have a question, if you could please put it in the Q&A box um, at the bottom center of your Zoom page, that would be really helpful to us. Um, so to begin, Kelly, and I do not want to chop up your last name, so I'm going to go with your first name only Kelly. Um, Kelly typed, my extended family are all Hispanic. And when I spoke to them and their friends and communities about being referred to as Latinx, they noted how they didn't like it and thought it was demeaning toward their culture and Spanish language. Um, Spanish is designed to be masculine and they feel they should be referred to as Latino. Any experience with that or thoughts or comments about you know, the evolution of language and how we're kind of, some communities are really shifting toward this Latin X terminology. Well, I, I certainly, um, you know, I can share from my experience uh, versus, you know, claiming expertise in this. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, say about the Latinx um, movement that I feel is really important. It, so, um, so many languages have a, a um, way of identifying by gender, which is really important. However, for our colleagues and, and community members and family members who don't identify specifically with a, a binary gender identity, the Latinx opportunity allows them to still feel included in a broader sense of community. And so, you know, definitely for elders, I, my approach would be to respect their wishes um, and and be very respectful of that. And when I can also introduce the idea that um, gender is now not, and always has been not seen as binary. So, um, so that's my my one perspective on it, and maybe others have something to add about that as well. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those conversations that's going to, I think, continue to be at the forefront of all of our work and within our communities. Um, Angelica Espinal Garcia wants to know if you can please expand on intergenera intergenerational trauma. I can. And so I'm, I apologize to you for scrolling. I just wanted to make sure that you all, um, per the request, have the the slides with the contact information. So, and then um, the following slide also has my contact information. So intergenerational trauma is another tricky thing. Um, so, so actually a lot of, um, a lot of medical research has shown that, that we um, actually house traumatic exposure in our bodies and the way, um, the way we um, metabolize trauma, if you will, it's kind of a metaphor. Um, there, are, there are many neurological and neurobiological responses that we have that change our chemistry. Um, some folks believe that that um, that type of trauma exposure can, in fact, increase our risk for certain types of disease. And so many, I'm sure, if not all of you are familiar with the adverse childhood experiences. Um, study that has now over two decades of data with regard to higher prevalence of heart disease, you know, types of cancer, uh, et cetera. So um, the idea of intergenerational trauma, one way of understanding that is when we, when we um, host or carry trauma exposure within our bodies, it influences and impacts our upcoming generations. And, um, and so, and that can include things like, um, you know, preterm birth, uh, premature, you know, birth, etc. So there, there are a lot of biological and physiological impacts that can occur intergenerationally. Yeah, excellent. And that's one perspective. Another perspective is that we, there's a psycho, psychodynamic or psychosocial aspect of it that when we are traumatized, then we um, behave in a certain way toward the, our children and others. Um, and I don't ascribe to that. When I, when I talk about intergenerational trauma, I'm specifically thinking about uh, the biological and um, physiological components that influence our um, you know, our health and well-being cross-generationally. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, again, there's, there's definitely a lot of nuance to, to these pieces. Um, Sylvie wants to know if you could elaborate on the Latinx paradox. Any occupational oh. exceptions to the paradox? For instance, farm workers, any of those pieces? Thank you. Oh, that's such a good question. And um, you know, actually, in my practitioner life, um, I I am not um, fully trained as a public health social worker, but I have had many years' experience as public health social worker out in community. And so, this happens to be something I feel um, really passionately about because you know, when when preventive argument, so primary preventive argument could be that as we address points of oppression and other trauma exposure, um, health outcomes will positively increase over time uh, within our communities rather than decrease and decline. So that's, that's almost like a, another motivator for me in doing this work. Um, but I want to say what's, um, what's interesting, if we look at it by disease type, uh, there are certainly, you know, for our our Latinx communities, there are certainly particular diseases that um, that influence our communities more dramatically, one of which is diabetes. And so um, the exceptions really are about how closely we maintain our, our cultural and traditional ties. Uh, speaking heritage language is actually protective against public health risk. So when we, we think about the Latinx paradox, we think about, you know, speaking specifically our, our languages of origin, um, and that actually is protective, and, and they believe that's true because it, it, um, it maintains, you know, our connections with tradition. So including health um, 
you know, health positive and health promotive traditions. So um, another thing that I think uh, is a little bit frustrating, you'll see in the literature, they talk about, it's kind of, kind of um, an offensive to me or odd term, but they talk about the salmon phenomenon. And what they mean by that is, is they assert that folks, um, who immigrate and have positive health outcomes, they then leave the United States. And so it's difficult to know what the health outcomes are in the future. So that's skewing the data. I don't, I don't ascribe to that belief. And I think a lot of research out there doesn't either. So, um, so the idea for us to keep that paradox, you know, the positive aspects of that paradox alive is really about um, maintaining our, our roots and our um, histories and our heritage. So thank you. That's an excellent question. Thank you. I am so fascinated by the Latin, uh, the Latino paradox. Yeah, me, you know? yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I, I've seen, you know, it in, in real life. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, all right. So Alexandra Boneo wants to know if Marianismo is for women. So in its, um, in its original definition, it, it was ascribed to um, feminine or people, you know, um, people who identify as women. And, you know, ma ma machismo was very much um, a masculine identity and marinismo was very much a feminine identity. And um, from, so I think there was a question earlier that I wasn't able to well address around what did I mean when I said those terms were colonized? Um, so, you know, if you, if, and again, this is, so please know this is my opinion and I welcome disagreement around this because again, these can be oppressive concepts, but, you know, for a long while I did work in, um, intimate partner violence prevention and, you know, we would hear, um, from community members coming in and, and identifying strongly with these different roles, right? Like, um, being, uh, being responsible for our children's spiritual and, you know, and our, our children's spiritual well-being and other types of well-being, um, you know, really seeing a strong identity with nurturance, those were positive attributes that they would express. And when the compliment um, machismo was discussed, it was considered to be oppressive and violent, associated with violence, which is not what it's meant um, from a, from some traditional perspectives. And so when I say something's colonized, I mean, you know, in its purest form, it's meant to create balance and health and well-being and, um, and sustainability, you know, over the, a long period of time for families versus um, something that would ever manifest in violence. And, and that's what I meant by the term colonization. But what I, what I would like to kind of introduce is the idea, especially, you know, our, our, young are, you know, emerging um, adults and youth speak so much about challenging a gender binary and not wanting to be constrained um, to a particular gender identity. And so, you know, there could be a person who identifies either with the masculine or the feminine in a way that is not, um, you know, a gender by biology, it could be a gender by um, identity. So, so that's why I, I hesitate to say whether this is solely for women, this term. Perfect, thank you. So kind of as a great segue into another question that we have that's, that's similar. Um, George, again, I do not wanna butcher your last name, um, but it begins with a B. So George B would like to, would like perhaps an explanation on how empowerment and protection can be patriarchal and or matriarchal. Ah, okay. Um, huh. Well, okay. So let me, let me see. Can you read it again, Maxine, just so I can fully. Sure. Into um, it? Okay. Would like to know or get an explanation on how empowerment and protection can be patriarchal yes, and okay. or patriarchal. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so actually, I had a I had a really good dialogue about this. I um I had the honor to present at a um a national conference for social workers recently, and and we really kind of dug into this idea of empowerment. And so, um, it is. So a lot of um, public policy in the United States does have a protective or patriarchal 
um, lens to it. And the idea of empowerment, I think, um, again, you know, in its purest sense is really about helping individuals find that voice and, um, and, and, you know, gain that sense of self-efficacy and really be able to um, have faith and belief in their own healing and their own points of resilience. But it can also be a, a way to further oppression by, you know, assuming that the, that person doesn't either one know what they need in order to heal or to, um, to be resilient. Uh, it also kind of assumes that the power can be given from one person to another. And in fact, we all possess personal power, you know, through our lived experiences, through our points of identity. So I would much rather like to see us think about ways that we can create safety and space and um, opportunity for meaningful voice and exploration, more so than perceiving it as if I have something that I can either give or I can, you know, restrict from another person. So that's how I look at it. Um, when you know because my my history a lot is um has been in corrections as especially in the world of juvenile justice uh patriarchy is i mean just heavy heavy in the juvenile justice system and so we see our young so our young women of color our young people of color as a whole um but a lot of young latinas are incarcerated and they're kept incarcerated because the courts um, perceive their home environments not to be safe for them, but somehow they perceive incarceration as being a, a better and more safe. And so, you know, I just want to say that that kind of decision making is um, impacts the people, communities who we serve every single day and absolutely is patriarchal in nature. And so, you know, how we could shift that is, is really to look at how do we, how do we balance power? How do we, you know, how do we fight kind of this, um, this oppressive stance that many institutions take. So I think that's a great question. I hope I answered it. Um, and yes. <laughs> great. So we probably have time for one more question, but I do want to just let you know that we have been receiving quite a bit of just thanks and praise. And one in particular comes from Lupe uh, Salazar, she is an executive director of a nonprofit organization in New Mexico, and she just wanted to, you know, really stress her gratitude for the work that you're doing and for the presentation of this material to a broader audience, uh, because these concepts have been kind of really been a part of the, the landscape and the vernacular for some of our com communities. But in some ways, it creates this additional sense of validation when we're hearing that other people are having these conversations and that, you know, so many folks are actually showing up to um, not only receive and learn this information, but also to be engaged with it. So Lupe, thank you for everything that you do as well. Um, but I wanted to say that before our last question. And potentially, we, we're going to do our very best to take whatever questions we can't get to during this live event. And we'll work with Anna and um, we will get some answers to these questions posted onto our website. That would be oh, excellent. Yeah. 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 And then of course, if you make it to part two, you know, potentially some of these questions will be answered in that um, information um, that's provided, you know, in a few weeks. So the last question during the live event, Thomas Grant would like to know, as a nation, how do we shift awareness of white men specifically to understand that critical trauma theory is real? I am a white male, but see too many people who believe that if trauma and racism does not exist in their world, then it does not exist at all. Um, and potentially ignorance is much easier than awareness. Uh, oh, well, that, you know, that is um, so powerful and uh, the topic of probably hours of conversation, if not days of conversation. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being an ally in this work um, and for raising that really important question. And briefly, I want to say um, for anyone who's interested sort of in anti-oppression, you know, stuff, you, many of you, again, might also know about the term interest convergence. And so the idea is, is that 
that policy and practices um, from a dominant culture perspective do not transform unless they have benefit and value to dominant culture. And in this case, it would be those who, you know, who self-identify as European American, Anglo or white. Um, and you know, there's a, a lot of discussion about does um, do Latinx uh, priorities need to be um, to be embedded in this idea of interest convergence? And what I would say is absolutely no. Um, and that you know, the the way um, we can continue to build awareness, I think, is um, first by uh, exposure, by developing critical allyships with people who are interested in, in acting as, um, as ethical and authentic allies in this work. And I think having, having those difficult critical conversations that address things like microaggressions and, and other things help to build awareness about the prevalence of oppression and then what that how that can potentially influence and impact people. So it is a, a lifelong journey. Um, I continue, especially when I spend time with young people, I continue to feel incredibly hopeful. Um, and we're in a really uh, powerful political time right now. So, um, so it, it, you know, this time is to me feels very special and an opportunity for um, you know we might approach it from a, an anti-oppression lens. We might approach it from a, a racial healing lens. There there are a lot of different ways to approach the work, um, but we appreciate that there are allies such as yourself um, willing to partner with us in this process. Wow! Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, just want to remind everyone that a copy of this webinar, a recording will be available on our website in a few days. In addition, you will also find a copy of the of a PowerPoint of the entire slide deck from today's presentation. Uh, can we please have the next slide, Anna? Sure, absolutely. My, my um, slide advancing finger is, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> it's so, okay. So real we, quick, this is Anna's um, contact information. Again, it'll be available on the PDF version of the slide deck um, in, in a few days. So feel free to contact either the ATTC and or Anna if you have additional questions about today's webinar or the work that uh, both are doing. Next slide, please. Um, so part two of this dynamic series is going to take place on Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. We're already almost in 2020, goodness. Wow. Um, same time, 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. If you have not already registered, please do so um, and share that link, the registration link with any and everybody that you know. It'll be amazing if today is any indication of that. Next slide, please. Lastly, one more pull for the um, evaluation. Some of you have already started to work on it. I promise you really quick, won't take too much of your time, but will absolutely benefit uh, the future of, of our work. We appreciate you being here today and we thank you for everything that you do in our community. We hope that all of you and your families have a wonderful holiday season and we hope to see you next year. Have a great day. Take care everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma.